Hello, everybody, and welcome to chapter one, electrocardiography. We are going to talk about several things in this chapter. Um, we're going to talk about the history and importance of the ECG, opportunity that you will have as an ECG technician or in the ECG kind of field. We're going to talk about some legal and ethical issues, patient communication and education related to our job as ECG technicians. We're going to talk about infection control and measures that we need to take to pre prevent the spread of infection to our patients and ourselves. And also we're gonna talk about vital signs that relate to the ECG. So first of all, why is it, is it important, right? Why are ECGs such an important part of um, the, an assessment tool in healthcare? And the answer is that cardiovascular disease, so diseases of the heart, are, have been the number one cause of death in the United States since 1921. Um, cardiovascular disease is basically any disease of the heart and blood vessels. <clears throat> A few examples of cardiovascular disease are myocardial infarction, also known as heart attack, heart failure, um, and coronary artery disease. Um, in fact, coronary artery disease, disease specifically infects affects one in three American adults. Coronary artery disease is simply the narrowing of the arteries of the heart, which causes a reduced flow of blood to the heart, which is not great, right? Um, so if we're not getting as much blood to the heart, it's not getting all the nutrients that in oxygen that it needs to perform its job to its full ability. But the ECG can detect other things and help with assessments in other conditions and things that might be going on with your, with your patients. Um, ECGs can detect just abnormal heart rhythms, um, electrolyte imbalances. It can help to diagnose certain drug toxicities, um, metabolic disorders like hyper and hypoglycemia, hyper and hypothyroidism. It can help with... Um, evaluating pacemaker function and detecting congenital heart diseases, which is congenital that means born with, so at birth. The electrocardiograph um, is basically a recording of the heart's electrical activity. The ECG basically it's, it's recording the electrical conduct conductivity and putting it into tracings that we can study. Let me get back up to my notes here. And it was in 1887 that Dr. Waller here showed and discovered that the heart produces electrical currents with each beat. And this knowledge was taken by William Eindhoven um, to invent the first electrocardiograph. So an electrocardiograph is basically the instrument that we use to record that electrical activity. And in fact, William Eindhoven won a Nobel Prize in 1924 for his electrocardiograph. <clears throat> now, you might be thinking, I swear I've seen EKG written, not ECG. Well, EKG was the original name for this because cardio in Greek is spelt with a K. So you will see. ECG and EKG used interchangeably. It's the same thing. Now, advances in technology over the years have improved the availability, the speed, and the quality of interpretation of the ECG, even allowing, of course, doctors these days to monitor patients from locations, you know, far away, basically telemedicine, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about telemedicine in a little bit. So performing an EKG is not necessarily a difficult task, but it's vitally important that we do it appropriately well and how it's supposed to be done. Because if we don't do our ECG readings um, properly, this could affect, uh, essentially affect the patient's whole entire course of care, right? If you're not getting an accurate reading and the patient's doctor is basing their medications, their treatment, their diagnosis off of this ECG, then we can have problems. So let's see here. <clears throat> so like I mentioned, ECG is basically a tracing of the heart's electrical um, conductivity, right? ECG tracings are used to determine a lot of things about the patient's heart. Healthcare providers look at these ECG tracings to find abnormalities. Um, they look at it to get a baseline for how the patient's heart is doing at that given time. Um, and also so they can look at these tracings 
if an, a change or um, a problem arises later down the road, if they have a baseline, that's a, the ideal situation. So they can look at the baseline tracing to see what has changed, what is different now. In fact, it's recommended that adults at the age of 40 and older do an ECG annually as a part of their just general yearly checkup so that we can have these baselines to go off of. And ECGs are performed in a variety of healthcare settings. We've already mentioned the doctor's office. You guys know that it's done in hospitals. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these different settings because that's going to determine what type of tracing is done, the setting, the equipment used, et cetera. So let's talk about some of these. We're going to talk about, first of all, the health hospital, one of the most common places, obviously, for an ECG to be used. In the hospital, it's the 12 lead that's the most commonly used. This is frequently done. Um, in a couple of different, different scenarios, before surgery, um, and also during throughout surgery, and we'll talk about that in a minute, during a code blue, which is when somebody is going into a cardiac or respiratory arrest, they'll do an ECG. <clears throat> and then also when patients are having a variety of symptoms, because they're trying to use this as an assessment tool to see why is this patient having these symptoms, what's going on. Some of the symptoms that you might have um, might prompt an ECG, chest pain, of course, shortness of breath, dizziness, fainting, a change in mental status, or the patient's report of a different um, feeling in cardiac rhythm or rate, they're feeling something different. So continuous monitoring is done in the, you might have somebody come into the emergency room and they get an ECG done. You might also have somebody being on a floor or a unit where they're doing continuous cardiac monitoring. I already mentioned during surgery, um, it's going to be done during surgery, surgery throughout the process procedure so that the patient's heart can be monitored to make sure nothing is going wrong. Um, you'll also see continuous monitoring typically in places like the intensive care unit, the cardiac care unit or CCU, surgical intensive care unit, the SICU, or in the ED. Um, <clears throat> What we're wanting to do when we're on continuous monitoring is looking at the patterns of the heart's electricity, electrical activity over time. And that's when you'll see patients hooked up with the electrodes or sensors attached to their chest. And then there's the transmitter box in the hospital. It's a lot of times just in their pocket, right? Um, and it is sent, that information is sent directly and in, in immediately to a monitor, to a telemonitor. Now, doctor's offices, like we mentioned, are another common place that you're going to have um, ECGs done. Also here, usually it's going to be the 12 lead ECG. And we mentioned already, a lot of times it's done as routine diagnostics, um, part of the yearly checkup. <clears throat> it's also done a lot of times for treadmill um, or stress testing, which you may have heard of. So treadmill or stress testing is done to determine basically if the heart is getting adequate blood flow during exercise or stress. And so when we're doing these treadmill stress testing, we're basically provoking ischemia or provoking, if it's there, if it's going to be there, this inadequate blood supply to the heart um, so that we can see how is this uh, related to um, the ECG tracings that we're getting and helping to diagnose any cardiac abnormalities. Halter monitor is something else that you're going to um, come across and we'll talk more about in later chapters. Um, Halter monitor is basically a type of ambulatory monitoring. It's basically a small box that is attached to the patient for between 24 and 48 hours that takes a continuous tracing of the heart to see what's going on over that period of time when the patient's just going about their daily business. Another Similar but different one is an event monitor. So this is also worn by the patient as they're going about their daily activities, their normal stuff that they're doing every day. But the difference with the halter monitor and an event monitor is the event monitor is going to be worn for a longer period of time, sometimes up to 30 days. And the patient in this case has to be instructed that when they start to feel symptoms, that's when they hit that they want to have this activity recorded and sent. So part of our job as ECG technicians, depending on where we're working, might be to instruct patients how to make sure that they're properly recording and sending that information when those events occur. Excuse me. So let's talk about um, some situations outside of the hospital. And we're going to talk about defibrillators, AEDs, and telemedicine here. So 
typically we think, or when I think of an ECG outside of the hospital, the first thing that comes to mind for me is like a cardiac emergency, right? Like an, if someone's having a heart attack um, or a cardiac arrest. So a lot of times we think of e, um, EMTs and paramedics, they're equipped with these portable ECG machines that they can use to attach to patients on, at the scene or in their home, wherever it might be, to detect these abnormal electrical activities that might be happening it, to the heart in that moment and potentially doing um, giving a shock or, or giving cardiac medications. <clears throat> So defibrillators, um, and we'll go back, well, let's talk about the AEDs or the automatic external defibrillators first, because that's what you're going to think of when you're thinking of the paramedics or the EMTs. So not only do the paramedics and EMTs have the ability to use these, but they are now so um, user friendly that the lay person can use these. So these are, AEDs are available now in a lot of public and private places where large numbers of people gather or live. So nursing homes, um, swimming pools, malls, uh, things like that. When an AED is put on a, on a patient or an individual, it's basically analyzing the heart for a shockable rhythm. Usually these are gonna in, include a pulseless ventricular tachycardia or VTAC or ventricular fibrillation, which you may hear called VFib. Um, what these AED machines are trying to do is give a shock to, to correct that abnormal electrical pattern. And so defibrillators, Right. These also are for the treatment of abnormal rhythms, um, the V, the pulseless VTAC and the VFib. Uh, the defibrillators again also produce an electrical shock that shock that designed to get that heart back into a normal electrical rhythm. <clears throat> okay, so telemedicine. I mentioned that a minute ago here, um, but basically, whenever you have ECG tracings that are done somewhere else, and those tracings are communicated with the physician, whether it be transtelephonic monitoring or digital monitoring. So what's the difference? So the difference between transtelephonic monitoring and digital monitoring, transtelephonic requires a licensed practitioner to read and evaluate the tracing. Digital monitoring, on the other hand, provides a report that is then validated by the licensed practitioner. So a little bit different there. Telemedicine is gonna help a physician to evaluate a patient over time. A lot of times um, these types of monitoring, these trans-telephonic or digital monitoring are done over a course of up to 30 days. And again, with these situations, these individuals, these patients that are gonna have this ongoing monitoring might need to be instructed on how to make sure they're recording and properly sending these transmissions to the provider so that it's done and read and interpreted appropriately and in a timely manner. So these can also be those continuous or the symptom based like we talked about the Holter monitors or the event monitors. <clears throat> so there are a variety of opportunities for someone in the um, ECG kind of field, right? There are some careers that deal exclusively with the ECG, and that's what, what we're doing right now, the ECG technician, right? And we're going to talk about the difference between these, these three that are listed on this slide. You've got an ECG technician, an ECG monitor technician, which you might also hear called a telemetry technician, and then a cardiovascular tech. So let's talk about those for, uh, uh, for a minute. So the ECG technician is someone who records and then prepares a report and hands it over to the physician for interpretation and uh, using that as an assessment tool. Um, so someone who's an ECG technician should be able to get an accurate tracing. And on top of that, not they don't have to interpret the tracings, but they do need to be able to identify when they're looking at a tracing, when interference has caused an abnormality in the reading. And when we talk about infer interference, we're talking about the patient was moving or talking, the lead was not on properly. So as ECG technicians, we need to know when is interference causing an abnormality? So I need to fix this so that I can send a good report to that physician to look at. Most ECG technicians work in the hospital setting, but they can work elsewhere as well. So now you're talking about an ECG um, monitor tech or a teletech. 
The difference here is that these individuals, they're also viewing the ECG tracings, but they're analyzing and reporting um, electro, elect, reporting this electoral activity of multiple patients at one time. So a lot of times these are people that are going to work in the telemonitoring room at a hospital or another inpatient facility where they're watching patients on continuous monitoring, like we were talking about before. Um, someone that's in the tele, tele unit, the um, cardiac care unit, et cetera. So their main responsibility of the tele tech or the monitor tech is to view the ECG tracing. And if it's abnormal, if it's an abnormal rhythm, they are, um, that prompts them to immediately notify that healthcare provider. So an ECG monitor tech or tele tech has to be able to accurately evaluate the actual tracing itself and know again when there's an abnormal reading. Your cardiovascular tech, that's kind of your, your um, next step up because this requires more advanced and extensive training. These cardiovascular techs, they do ultrasounds of the heart and the blood vessels, and they assist physicians with invasive cardiovascular diagnostic tests and procedures, such as heart surgery, angioplasty, or the implantation of a pacemaker. Um, like I mentioned, they also do um, ultrasounds of the heart and vessels. And just so you know, an ultrasound, if you don't know what that is already, that's basically a specialized equipment that as a cardiovascular tech, you would be trained on. Um, and what an ultrasound does is it transmits sound waves and collects echoes from those sound waves and uses those, it's amazing, to create an image that we can actually see um, what the heart and the blood vessels are doing. And then of course, there are other career fields where ECGs are a part of our job. It's not solely what we do. And just a few examples, medical assistants, nurses, um, the EMTs and the paramedics. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, preparing patients for an ECG. Um, and that is going to include communicating with your patient, being aware of legal and ethical considerations, and of course, making sure our equipment is in order. So legal and ethical issues, what's the difference? So we've got laws and we've got ethics. Laws are rules of conduct that are enforced by some sort of authority. And that might be our professional, um, our professional organization, um, the hospital we work in. So unlawful acts can result in loss of job, jail time, fines, et cetera. Ethics, on the other hand, are standards of behavior. It's our knowledge of right from wrong. It's more, it's our morals. And usually because it's morals, it's, it is based informed, how, how we view ethics is based informed on our society, our culture, our family, how we were raised. So it's important to know, again, when looking at the difference between laws and ethics, that illegal acts, so doing something illegal is always unethical. But there are unethical acts that are not always considered illegal. Part of go discussing laws and ethics always includes HIPAA, or the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Now, this was established in 1996, and what was going on then is there was a lot of medical, personal, um, personal health information being transferred electronically from facility to facility, doctor to doctor, et cetera. Um, so it was, it was known that we need to establish some sort of standard, national standard for electronic healthcare transactions to make sure that this information was kept private and secure. So patients, what this said was patients can specify who is allowed to see their information and what information is protected. It also said that patients' information should only be viewed and shared on a need to know basis. And this is important. This is where you can get into trouble, right? If you violate HIPAA, you're looking at um, potential jail time, fines and loss of your job for sure. So need to know basis means if I'm an ECG tech and I have the whole, I have access essentially to the chart, but I only need to view what is relevant to what kind of care I'm doing. So my, what I'm viewing on the patient's medical history and medical chart and record is gonna be different than say what a nurse would be viewing for that patient because it's a need to know basis. What do you need to know, view and see to do your job? And that's as far as you go. And of course, this also includes things like not talking about the patient in the hall, um, not 
opening your neighbor's chart just because you notice your neighbor is in the room next to you. So that is all um, patient privacy HIPAA. And a term you need to be familiar with is protected health information. So you'll see that abbreviated PHI. This goes along with HIPAA. This is any information about the health status, um, the use of healthcare services, and payment for health services that is personally identifiable and can be linked to an individual. So this is, if, if you think it can link information to your patient, that is considered public protected health information. This could be their address, it could be their medical diagnosis, um, social security number, date of birth, et cetera. So when we're talking about practicing ethics, um, jumping back to that a bit, because every profession will have, or most professions will have a code of ethics. Healthcare providers have a code of ethics as it relates to healthcare. An IT company will have a code of ethics as it relates to their company. So this is basically a standard and behavior that is defined by a professional group. And confidentiality, respect, and dignity all fall under this code of ethics. Confidentiality is a basic right of every single patient. Respect and dignity must be provided for all patients as well. We can provide um, respect by acting professionally, um, addressing someone by their um, proper name. So Mrs. Smith instead of Hey Jen or whatever it might be. Acting professionally also includes making sure we're doing our continued education and we're up to date on the most, um, or we're doing the most up to date training because all that is being a professional and giving our patients the highest level of care. Dignity and respect is also provided by just making sure we're providing privacy. We're not overexposing our patients as we're setting them up on the ECG machine. Um, and acting professionally does include, as mentioned in this slide, working well with not only the patients, but family members and the rest of the healthcare team. Professional liability, oh, sorry there, is something else that you need to be familiar with um, because it's, it's up to you. It's your liability. Professional liability means that you are legally responsible for your own performance. It means you can be held accountable if you perform any unlawful acts, um, if you perform something improperly, or if you fail to act when you should have. So a few examples of that. Performing unlawful acts. Your patient leaves, you find their wallet, you decide to take out that cash before you turn that in, right? Um, performing legal acts improperly. You report a blood pressure, but you weren't being careful and you actually gave the wrong numbers or the number for a different patient. And then that affected the treatment that that doctor did for your patient. So that's performing a legal act improperly. An example of failing to perform an act when necessary, um, let's say your job, you are a telemonitor and you're in that monitor room monitoring all those patients on their um, on tele and you decide you're just going to go ahead and go get yourself a snack out of the snack machine and you leave those monitors unattended. That would be failing to perform a duty, okay? So what's important to get from all of this is it's our responsibility we can't claim ignorance. We can't blame it on anybody else. It's our responsibility to work within our scope of practice and the standards that are set by our profession. A couple other terms you want to be familiar with, slander and libel. Um, we are going to be speaking, uh, um, speaking about our patients to other healthcare professionals um, on the need to know basis, of course, and we're going to be documenting about our patients. And we have to maintain professional, uh, our professionalism. Slander and libel um, are both illegal and unethical, and they can result in, um, in jail time, fines, loss of job, etc. So what's the difference between slander and libel? Slander is when we make a derogatory remark or statement um, about somebody that could jeopardize their reputation or their means of livelihood. That's slander. Now, libel, same thing, except that's when we actually have it written down. So slander and libel, same thing, making derogatory marks, ruining someone's reputation, their livelihood potentially, but slander is uh, verbal, libel is written. So just make sure you know the difference between those two. All right, let's talk a little bit about documentation um, because documentation is incredibly important, okay? Um, documentation is part of the medical record, 
Um, all care and treatment that's done has to be documented. If it's not documented, it didn't happen. Um, a medical record is a means of communication among all the healthcare team. So if we're not documenting accurately and appropriately, the rest of the healthcare team is not gonna know what's going on. Medical records, it's important to know that they can be used in a court of law if there's some sort of medical um, liability case that's going along. So it's a protection to us that we document what we did as ECG technicians and that we did our job appropriately um, and well. So all entries in a medical record for these reasons need to be clear, accurate, legible, dated and signed, and factual, okay? Um, and keep in mind that paper, it could be paper or electronic. Now, definitely more often than not these days, it's electronic, but still might be a paper document as well. And all of those pieces have to be there. Okay, let's move on. And it's a lot of information, but just some key terms that you really have to be familiar with as we're preparing to work with patients, okay? So consent, you guys have heard of consent before. Before you, before you perform an ECG or any procedure on a patient, you have to get consent. Um, there are a different, couple different types of consent. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to go forward. Um, there's implied consent and there's written or informed consent. So most ECGs that we do are implied consent. If someone shows up to have um, a, a treadmill stress test, they're in giving, they're saying you can do the ECG. Um, another example of implied consent, if you're asking to take that patient's blood pressure and they just reach their arm out to you, they don't say anything, but they reach their arm out, they're saying, yes, you can take my blood pressure. Um, informed or written consent, some procedures that are done like surgery or that stress um, treadmill stress test um, will need informed consent. I realize I just gave an example that didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I said that most ECGs are implied consent. So if you have someone that comes in for a treadmill stress test, it's implied that you're okay to hook them up to the ECG monitor. Now that stress test itself, um, because there are risks and benefits of doing that stress test, that stress test itself does so does require an informed or written consent. The patient has to understand the procedure, the benefits, if there's any alternatives, any risks of doing the stress test or risks of not doing the stress test. And once that's fully understood, then they can sign and have a written informed consent. There are some situations in which your patient might not be able to read. Um, now, Usually this is done with a nurse or a doctor um, and a witness present that this process or procedure is going to be explained to that patient thoroughly. They're going to be given the chance to ask as many questions as they want and verbalize their understanding. In that case, the patient can sign with an X and then you're going to have to have the witness um, signature as well. So just something to be aware of that that may come up. We're talking about patient education and communication. Um, this is vitally important to our job as ECG technicians, because we're working one-on-one -on -one with these patients and they're coming in for um, a, a procedure um, that might feel, you know, after we've done it so many times, it might, it's going to start coming to us second nature. We don't think much about it, but this might be someone's first time getting an ECG done. This might be related to a really scary health thing that they have going on. They may have fears and questions. So developing a positive and trusting relationship and atmosphere is gonna really reduce apprehension and anxiety for our patients. They're gonna have trust in us and they're gonna feel more comfortable. So communication is key. We wanna always make sure we introduce ourselves and explain what we're gonna do before we start to do it. We wanna make sure we help the patient to understand the procedure. Um, when we're doing this, remember, we don't know our patient's level of education or understanding of, of the healthcare system or field. So we want to use simple terms. We want to speak slowly and clearly and always give our patient the opportunity to ask questions and kind of repeat back to us if there's instructions given to make sure that they understand. Ways that we can do this and make sure um, our patients are hearing us and understanding and feeling trusting, you know, make eye contact, make sure we're facing the patient. Don't turn your head and talk to the patient looking the other way. Um, you can always, as the patient's talking to and asking questions, when we repeat and kind of clarify what they're saying, that makes them know that we understand what, what they're trying to communicate with us. The term you're gonna hear um, in your text uh, is therapeutic communication. This is basically um, using verbal and nonverbal techniques to make sure that messages are received 
interpreted and understood. So that's therapeutic communication. Um, all right, so now we're gonna kind of jump to a whole other, not a whole other thing, that's not true, but we're gonna talk a little bit about infection control. Um, so infection control, a couple terms you need to be aware of is healthcare associated infections. So HAIs, you'll see the abbreviated. Let me see if I have that on the next, I don't. Um, HAIs or healthcare associated infections are infections that occur while a patient is receiving medical or surgical care. So preventing these healthcare associated infections is essential or it's an essential aspect of our job. The CDC, so Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has implemented two levels of precautions to prevent the spread of infection. And the first one that you see here is standard precautions. Um, standard precautions are basically, the biggest thing is hand hygiene. That's washing our hands appropriately, properly, and at the right times. Um, standard precautions state that we're gonna wear gloves whenever there is a possibility of exposure to blood and body fluids, non-intact skin or mucous membranes. It says we to treat all blood and body fluids as if they were infected because sometimes people are infected and we don't know. So standard precautions could include additional PPE and we're gonna talk about that on the next slide a little bit, um, but that's personal protective equipment. Um, all blood, and let me make one clarification here. When we're talking about um, blood and body fluids, it also, it's any secretions or excretions except for sweat. Sweat is not considered one that is gonna transmit infections and disease. So we talked about um, PPE sometimes is needed as well. So PPE could include gown, masks, or eye protection. And this depends on what, so if I only expect that there's a risk of becoming in contact with blood or body fluids, from hands down, then it's only gloves that's necessary. If there's a risk, I think, of being exposed to blood or body fluids beyond the gloved hand, that's what I'm going to need to consider a gown or a mask or a shield or goggles, right? Um, there's a couple other recommendations that the CDC gives and advises to help keep us and our patients safe. And that's avoiding wearing artificial nails, nail polish, and keeping our nails shorter than about a fourth inch long. The thing with artificial nails and nail polish is that they have been proven with testing to harbor and grow more bacteria than just our, our natural short nails. So that's the reason they recommend that. Now, before I jump into isolation precautions, that is, remember I said the CDC made two tiers of protection, standard precautions. The other one is isolation precautions. That's kind of the second level. Um, but before I talk about isolation precautions, I want to mention two other things. Um, it is also our job as ECG technicians to make sure that our equipment and supplies are clean. Um, there's a ter two terms you want to know. Medical asepsis. That's basically the practices designed to reduce the number and the transfer of pathogens or germs and break the chain of infection. So we clean our supplies, we clean our tables, we clean our equipment in between every single patient to make sure that we're not spreading germs. Now, a lot of times, I mentioned one other term, it's the safety data sheet or SDS. You need to at least know what this is. So I mentioned we're cleaning our equipment, our supplies between every single patient. A lot of times this is gonna involve some sort of chemical disinfectant for cleansing. Not something we're gonna be using on our patients, but something we're gonna be using to clean our equipment. So because we're using chemical disinfectants as ECG technicians, we need to know what an SDS or a safety data sheet is. This is gonna be provided to us. Um, any facility that we work in, you have an SDS. This is documentation, it's a book that provides um, information on any and every chemical substance that you may be using at your job. It documents the manufacturer, um, it lists the chemical components, it's gonna list the hazards and it's gonna, of using that chemical, and it's gonna list the immediate treatment that you need to do should you become exposed, whether it be inhalation in your eyes or on your skin. So make sure you just know what medical asepsis and SDS are. All right, so let's go ahead now. We're gonna talk about that second layer, uh, tier, excuse me, and this is their isolation precautions. Um, now, Isolation precautions are for patients with specific infections. So standard precautions are for everybody. Isolation precautions are for specific infections. And it's based on how that infectious agent is transmitted. And when we talk about infectious agent pathogen, we're talking about germs um, that cause infection. 
So there's airborne droplet and contact. Airborne precautions are when the germ can spread through the air. That means they are light, they can travel farther, they can travel on air currents or dust. And that means if it's airborne, that space, that room is gonna require special ventilation. And if you're working with a patient with an airborne um, infection, you're gonna be wearing an N95 or other respirator style mask to protect you from breathing that in. Droplet precautions, um, that's, they can still travel through the air, but they don't travel quite as far, usually three feet or less. Um, and those are the ones that are going to travel usually when you, um, well, airborne can travel when you sneeze or cough. But again, the droplet's just not going to go quite as far. It might go and then land on that person. And, and because of that, this type of precaution is going to require the addition of goggles and a mask so it doesn't get into your eyes, your mucous membranes. And the other one is contact precautions. So this is when you can get um, an infectious disease from direct skin to skin contact or direct contact with an infected piece of equipment, a tabletop, linens, et cetera. So we're not only gonna, we're not only gonna be wearing gloves, we're also gonna be wearing a gown to prevent our clothing and our hands and our body from coming into contact with an infectious agent. So for this, you're going to want to definitely review. Um, it's on page 18 in your textbook. It's table 1-4. Make sure to review that. Okay, let's talk about vital signs. So, and then I think that might be the last thing we're going to talk about. Yes, it is. So vital signs. We're almost there, folks. Um, vital signs are one of the most important assessments of a patient's current health status. If something's off with the vital signs, it's a signal to us that something is off with the patient's body at that moment. So ECGs may be responsible, or ECG technicians or professionals may be responsible for taking vital signs. So you have to know vital sign ranges, okay? And on page 19 in your textbook, table 1-5 is gonna give you the normal ranges for adults. Keep in mind, normal ranges for adults is for adults. So it's gonna vary for kids and, and um, babies. Make sure you are familiar with the normal ranges. Now, we're going to talk specifically, these are all pulse, respiration, blood pressure, temp, um, your pulse oximetry, weight, and pain. These are all vitally important vital, vital signs. But as an ECG technician, the ones that you are going to be dealing with most often are going to be pulse, respiration, and blood pressure. So we're going to talk very briefly about those three. And then most importantly, you're going to get hands-on practice in skills lab. So pulse and respiration. Pulse is going to give us information about the patient's cardiovascular system. It's basically a measurement of, or an indirect measurement, I should say, of the patient's cardiac output. And what's cardiac output? It's basically how much blood that heart can pump out in about a minute, okay? So if you're taking someone's pulse, which we usually take on the radial, um, the radial pulse here on the wrist, if you notice that it's weak or irregular or abnormally fast or slow, that could be a sign that the cardiac output is low. So we typically, like I mentioned, take pulse at the radial artery, which you're going to pa uh, practice, and we always count for one full minute. Well, you may ask yourself, why can't I count for 30 seconds and double it, or 15 seconds and times it times four? Because if you, only, if you don't check for a full minute, you can miss an irregularity, and that's why it's so important. So when we're feeling, we're making note, is it the rhythm regular or irregular? Is it weak? Is it strong? Is it bounding? Um, if for some reason we cannot take a radial pulse, the second choice is going to be the carotid artery. And again, you're going to get some real good hands-on practice in skill lab checking each other's radial pulse. Respirations. Um, this is an indication of how well a patient's body is providing oxygen to all of our tissues. So we check respiration by using a few different senses, actually. Watching, listening, and feeling. Um, sometimes we don't have to do all of those. Like we can watch, if you can easily see the rise and fall of someone's chest, um, that's going to be good. Some people are real shallow breathers, and you might have to actually put a hand on their shoulder or the top of their chest here to feel the rise and fall. Just like with uh, poles, we're checking respirations for a full minute because we need to observe for irregularities. And when we're observing for respirations, um, something to keep in mind is you don't want to necessarily tell the patient right away that you're taking respiration. And this isn't because we don't want to be straightforward and honest with our patients, but think about it. If someone tells you they're going to watch you breathe for a minute, a lot of times that causes us to change how we're breathing because we're just thinking about it. So you'll practice this in skills lab as well. One of the most common ways to do it is, you know, as you're taking pulse, take your pulse for a minute. And then for the next minute, 
keep that finger on there and actually be observing for respiration. So you'll get, again, you'll get practice with this. Or if you have a, have a stethoscope and you're listening to the heart sounds or the lung sounds, for that last bit there, use that, keep the stethoscope on the patient, but actually be counting the respirations. So we wanna make sure these respirations, um, we wanna look at the rate, the rhythm, the effort or quality. So is, is it deep? Are they shallow? Are they breathing irregular? Um, is it really fast or really slow? So some key terms you wanna be familiar with, and I'm just gonna kind of name them because they're in your text, but you wanna be familiar with hyperventilation, dyspnea, tachypnea, hyperpenia, rails, and ronchi. Um, and so just be familiar with those terms in your text so you know those are all things that were um, relate to respiratory rate, rhythm, and quality for a patient. And finally, let's touch on blood pressure real quick. Another skill that really is going to hit home when you get into skills lab. Um, but our blood pressure is basically the force at which our blood is pumped against the walls of our arteries. There's systolic and there's diastolic. Systolic is the pressure of when the heart is contracting and or the, um, the left ventricle, excuse me, specifically is contracting. And that's when that's ventricle, that left ventricle contracts and pushes that heart, uh, that blood out to the rest of our body. So that's like the strongest amount of contraction. That's why that systolic number is the highest number in a blood pressure reading. Diastolic, that's the bottom number. Um, that's when our heart is relaxing and filling. So you expect it to be lower, a lot lower, um, because you want that heart to be able to relax completely and therefore fill, therefore fill back up with blood. So there are definitely some factors that affect blood pressure and specifically some different risk factors. And I'll just, I don't know if I have that. Sorry, I didn't go through the slides. Um, here we go. So some risk factors that affect blood pressure, being overweight or obese, um, a lack of physical activity, regular physical activity, too much salt in the diet, too much alcohol consumption, um, which can be greater than one to two drinks a day, stress age, genetics, these all play factors in our blood pressure. Um, there are also some internal factors that play a role in our blood pressure, and that is that cardiac output that we talked about, our blood vol volume, our blood viscosity, and vasoconstriction. So hypertension and hypotension are definitely terms you want to be familiar with. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Anytime you see the word hyper, that's high. Hypo, anytime you see that word, is low. So hyper blood, blood, hypertension, excuse me, is high blood pressure. Hypotension is low blood pressure or lower than normal blood pressure. Hypertension can be broken down into either essential um, or secondary hypertension. Essential hypertension, you'll also hear it called idiopathic. This is when there's no immediately identifiable cause of the high blood pressure. Secondary hypertension, on the other case, occurs as a result of some other conditions, such as they have cardiac, um, so they have heart disease, they have kidney disease, and that's changing their um, blood pressure. Hypotension, like I mentioned, um, some people have just a lower than normal blood pressure, and that's fine for their day to day. But when the hypo hypotension becomes severe, that can actually reduce the blood flow to all of our vital organs, which is not good. We need blood flow to our vital organs. We need that oxygen, that blood, those nutrients. So severe hypotension can be present in conditions like dehydration, shock, heart failure, um, severe burning, or excessive bleeding. And again, you're gonna get a lot of practice taking some blood pressures on each other um, and just be familiar with some of these terms that we just reviewed over for these vital signs. And that is it, you guys. Thank you for hanging in there.